Good morning. It's Wednesday. Welcome to First Light. I'm glad that you're here today. And we want to look at the lectionary reading for, from John chapter 3 in the New Testament, the Gospel of John chapter 3. And this is, um, the lectionary reading begins at verse 31. Uh, we do miss a little bit of context that's actually very powerful. Um, so John the Baptist was first. He started preaching before Jesus did and had a sizable number of disciples and followers and many people were coming out to him to be baptized and then Jesus comes along and he points to Jesus and says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and when Jesus did that I mean when John the Baptist did that he lost two of his disciples so um, they went and joined Jesus they wanted to follow him well um, at some point jealousy potentially kicks in and so people come to John and they say, John, Rabbi, Rabbi, uh, there's some, this other guy, he's, he's baptizing people and everybody's going to him now. And of course, we know that um, Jesus himself wasn't doing the baptizing, but his disciples were. And just think about that for just a second. Everybody's going to him. How would you feel? John's response is, good. And that's in verse 27. To this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I'm not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him as full, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. Uh, so John says, I'm, hey, I'm not in this wedding party. I'm just, I'm just the bridegroom. I, I, I'm just the, the, uh, the friend who attends the bridegroom. I'm, I'm not. Jesus is where the main action is. And then, of course, the powerful words in verse 30 he, Jesus, must become greater, and I become must become less. And friends, I'm telling you, that ought to be the motto of every single Christian. Why don't you underline and put stars by verse 30? He, Jesus, he must become greater, and I must become less. That ought to be the passion of your life and mine that we want to become less and Jesus become greater in us. Well, now we get to the lectionary reading, and this is, this is a powerful passage in verse 31. John is still comparing himself and Jesus. The one who comes from above, that'd be Jesus, is above all. Now think about that for just a second. Um, you know, there are so many people who just don't believe that uh, the Bible teaches that Jesus is God or anything like that. Well, friends, think about, this is not a clear passage, but just think about it for a second. If Jesus had been born in the natural way and Joseph and, his mom, and, and Mary were both of his parents, both of them, completely, totally human, then how could he have been, quote, from above? The only way he can be from above is if he isn't a mere human being. So John is comparing himself. The one who comes from above is not only just from above, he is above all. I love that. He's not just from above. I mean, he is the top. He is above all things. And the one who is from the earth, well, that would be John. The one who's from the earth belongs to the earth. See, if, G, if Joseph was his daddy, then Jesus would belong to the earth. Um, the one who comes from heaven, there it is again, is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard. Now, that's this is now the he, I believe, here is John the Baptist. John is saying the one who's from the earth, he testifies to what, what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Now, um, you know, you can kind of debate that. Well, what do you mean? I thought people did believe John, but just understand that people did not truly understand that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't understand what that meant. John tried to tell people, 
but they had all these preconceived views of who Jesus was, what he would come to do. And remember, in the end, they sh the crowd shouted, crucify him, and all the disciples ran. Um, so I think this honestly is an accurate statement, even though it doesn't seem accurate at this moment, because John does, he has had some followers, but in reality, in the long run, no one had accepted his testimony. Um, he is simply a voice crying in the wilderness. Verse 33, the man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. Now, I'm just guessing here, but I think that's Jesus. Jesus is the one who completely accepted and believed everything John said. And when Jesus has done that, he is certifying that God is truthful. Verse 34, for the one whom God sent, now that'd be Jesus, speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. And of course, since Pentecost is this Sunday, I'm beginning to see why this passage is read this week in the lectionary. Let's just read 34 again. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. Friends, I, I, um, I just want you to have an idea in your mind that simply coming to the cross of Jesus and having the blood of Jesus applied to your life, which of course is absolutely essential, that's not all there is. And so I have found that that actually becomes a, a, um, a cry of the heart for some Christians who maybe they're not disillusioned, but they've got this, they understand the cross. They got it. They got it. The blood of Jesus, they got it. Um, and they've heard a lot of salvation messages. They got it, and they want other people to get saved. But at some point, they I've heard people uh, say the question, there's got to be something more. Is, is this all there is? And I think that part of, I think there's a lot more, actually, there's a lot of truth that you still can learn besides just how to go to heaven and what what happened on the cross. Um, and a lot of that has to help helps me live today. But I think part of the more is the Holy Spirit indwelling in us in a greater way than we have known before. Um, one of the things that, that some of you have heard me say more than once, this is one of my themes, is that the struggle of the Christian life ultimately is about surrender. We're called to surrender at the cross. My pride, my arrogance, my self-sufficiency, my self-righteousness, like we talked about yesterday, I surrender all of that. And I come humbly to the foot of the cross, the blood of Jesus is applied to my heart. I'm trusting in what he did for me. It's a humbling thing. And and that's a and that's a and I'm born again. I'm saved. Um but there's so much more beyond that. And so I want you to look at verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. So Jesus holds everything. I have learned to surrender at the cross, but now I'm learning to surrender other things, even though I'm already saved. I'm surrendering my will. I'm surrendering my plans. I'm surrendering my relationships. I'm surrendering my giving. God gets hold of my, my wallet. I'm surrendering my time. I'm surrendering... Think about all the things. It's a constant issue of surrender to the Lord Jesus. And surrendering to the Spirit is one way that we, or the filling of the Spirit, is one way that I think describes that event in our lives when we are surrendering uh, to God. So everything has been placed in Jesus' hands. And then I, verse 36 is another one of those verses you should underline and highlight, friends, because this is so powerful. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son 
will not see life for God's wrath remains on him. Now, friends, that, that passage is just chock full of meaning. Um, first of all, I want you to notice the tenses of the verbs. I'm sorry if this sounds like an elementary school lesson, but it's where a lot of the meaning is in this passage. Whoever believes, that's present tense, that's right now. Whoever believes, you could almost substitute is believing, it's now. Whoever believes in the Son has, do you see it? Has eternal life. That's right now. Eternal life, many people think, is that's heaven. That's that's life after you die. And that obviously is a part of it. But eternal life doesn't start at heaven. It starts at the moment you surrender to Jesus. That's when it starts. So I, look at the verbs. Whoever believes, present tense, in the Son, has right now eternal life. But whoever rejects present tense the son will not that's future tense see life so if a person if 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 you listening to my voice right now if you have if you are right now rejecting the son then friends your destiny right now is that you will not see life, eternal life. You're not going to see it. But the great part about this is, is that the rejecting part is present tense. So you may be rejecting him right now, but if that were to change, and an hour from now, tonight, tomorrow, you cease rejecting him, well, then the whole formula changes again. Everyone who goes to hell was present tense rejecting Jesus when they died. Now, I've jumped ahead a little bit because that last phrase, it's an eye-opener. It's It ought to catch your attention. So let's read verse 36 again. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see eternal life. For God's wrath remains present tense. You see it? Present tense. Friends, if you don't know Jesus, whether you realize it or not, the wrath of God is already on you because of your rebellion and because of your sin. And so this is, this is why so many people just simply do not understand that God does not, in essence, send people to hell. The reality is we send ourselves. We're already headed there. You're already headed there without Jesus. And that only changes when you cease the rejecting and then you begin to believe. And that word believe is not an, um, simply a mental agreement, but it is a commitment. It is a surrender. It is, it is a trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just reinforce this for you because uh, probably the most famous passage in the whole Bible is John chapter 6, uh, verse 13. John 3, verse 16, right? So look at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Once again, we are already perishing, but God doesn't want us to experience that. So he took the initiative. He did something about it. He sent Jesus so that we might have the opportunity to not... Uh, perish. That's the best definition of hell I know of, to perish. Um, and then verse 17, once again, reinforcing God's purposes. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
and it says in Peter, God is not willing that any perish. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He took steps that that would not happen. But we are given the powerful gift of free will. And if we are determined to pay for our sins ourselves, God's going to let us do it. I'd rather let Jesus pay for my sins and receive the free gift that he's offered me. What I wanted you to see is lots of people memorize and know verse 16. But what about verse 18? Whoever believes in Jesus, present tense, is not condemned, present tense, but whoever does not believe, present tense, stands condemned already, present tense, right now, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Friends, these are powerful words that help us understand the what many people call the plan of salvation. And, and I, I tell you, uh, Dr. Bill Bright, who founded Campus Crusade for Christ, I believe it was, um, he was so instrumental in my life with some of his teachings. He he studied the scriptures. He read authors. He asked a lot of questions for, okay, what? how are people saved? What What is the, if you want to call it, what we normally, I'm used to calling the plan of salvation. Help me understand that. And so he listened, he wrote stuff down. And what he did was, he did what a lot of great thinkers do. He, he helped to condense those down into the absolute nuggets of truth. And he came up with what was called back in, the, I guess it was the 80s or the late 70s, the four spiritual laws. Anybody remember those? I use them all the time when I witness to people. The first spiritual law is that God loves us. So you start with the love of God. God doesn't hate people. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And there's lots of scriptures that teach that. But there's a but. The but is that we're sinners. We sin. And uh, I don't know too many people who would disagree with that. In fact, people are rather proud of saying, well, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. Yeah, you're going to hell. I'm not trying to be flippant. I'm totally serious. We're not perfect. God only lets perfect people into heaven, friends. Hmm. So that must mean nobody's going to make it. In and of ourselves, that's right. But the blood of Jesus is an amazing... Oh, I'm jumping ahead. So (laughs) the first spiritual law is that God loves everybody. The second spiritual law is, but we're sinners. But now the third spiritual law is because God loves us, he did something about it. He sent his son to die for us, to pay for our sins. The blood of Jesus covers us and perfects us. That's what it means. The the apostle Paul uses the, the language of a trial court and a judge when he says that we have been declared innocent, we have been justified. The word justified means acquitted. Justified and pardoned are not the same thing. To be pardoned means you're guilty, but we're going to let you off. You could say I've been pardoned. That's not a bad biblical word. But justified is a better word than pardoned. Um, Justified is a powerful New Testament word that means just as if I'd never sinned. That's the way I learned it so many years ago. To be justified, it's a legal term to be acquitted. If you go to trial and you're charged with something and there's a trial and you end up being acquitted, well, you're not guilty of the crime. It's gone. The the crime ceases. And so... That's why we say only perfect people make it to heaven. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus, 
and what he did on the cross for you, even though I don't feel very perfect, even though I know that I'm a sinner, I know that, but I'm trusting in him and his blood covers me. In Revelation, who is it the ones who are in heaven? It's the ones who are wearing white robes that have been washed in the blood of the lamb. White is a symbol of purity, no stains, no blemishes. And it's a contradiction in human terms. Well, blood is one of the awfulest things you can get on your clothes, but it's spiritual. The blood of Jesus cleanses us completely. And so there's four spiritual laws, right? Well, that was just number three. The last one is the ball's now in your court. God gave you free will. You can accept him. You can reject him. Would you like to trust him? Would you like to say yes to Jesus right now? Friends, I've asked many people that question, and uh, I'm always appreciative of people who give me honest answers. I've, I've met, I remember a woman, I, I've known two people actually who've told me this. Um, when I asked that question, would you like to trust Jesus right now? Would you like to do that? And, and I remember a, a woman in Virginia Beach told me, she said, Brother Ronnie, I have waited all my life for somebody to help me with this. Friends, a, a six-year-old could have led her to Jesus. She's ready. She's ready. And then I've met people who said, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready now. And I usually respond graciously to them. I usually say, I, I really appreciate your honesty um, because it, you don't want to do anything that's fake. You don't, I'm not, I don't want to push you into doing something you don't want to do. Um, it wouldn't be real anyway. Uh, but I will do this. I want to be praying for you. And I'm praying that God will help you. And the reason I'm patient with people um, is because there are there is a branch of Christianity that wants to be hard-nosed with people at that moment and say, look, you could die in a car wreck and go to hell this afternoon or tonight. And that'd be a true statement. It's true. And they just really lay it on them and press them. And sometimes people surrender with that kind of language. Most of us don't. When I feel forced and pressed into making a decision I'm not ready to make, most of us just go the other way. Well, my experience was like that. I'm more patient with people because that's how I got saved. When someone asked me that question, uh, it was actually in a group of people, would, I, giving an, an invitation, who would like to give their life to Christ? I didn't raise my hand, even though I sensed something going on inside of me and I, ne and I needed to. But friends, what I ended up doing was I thought about it all the rest of that day. And that night, all by myself, alone in my room, I knelt beside my bed. I got down on my knees and I prayed something. I don't remember word for word what I said, but I basically simply said, Jesus, I believe you died for me. And I believe that your cross and your blood pays for my sins. And so right now, Lord... I want to put my trust in you. Come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. And where did I learn how to talk like that? I learned it from the woman who explained salvation to me, who explained the four spiritual laws. I just used the language that she helped me, which is biblical language. I didn't know that at the time. Um, but friends, I want to invite you right now. I just believe there's somebody listening right now. And it could be, you're listening to this today, right now, on May 27th, 2020. But the nature of the internet is somebody could be listening to this and it may be July. It may be Christmas. It may be 2027. And you were doing this internet search and this weird guy from, from Crestview, Florida came up and you're going, what in the world is that? I think I'll listen to that. And so you're listening to this right now. Friends, God's word does not return void. It goes out and it accomplishes things. It never is empty handed. And so I'm going to ask you right now, if you've never honestly and genuinely surrendered to the Lord Jesus, I'd like to invite you to do that right now. It doesn't matter that you and I are not in the same room because you're not getting saved because of me. You're surrendering to Jesus. Friends, I didn't ask you if you go to church. I asked you, I didn't ask you if you're a church member. 
Have you surrendered to Jesus? Because I was a, I was a member of church. I, I attended church. I grew up in church. But I didn't know the Lord until that day in 1972. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I am always struck and I, I marvel at these passages that constantly remind us, even in the presence of horrible statements of judgment and condemnation and wrath, in the middle of all that is your love. For God so loved the world is in the same passage as the word condemned and the word wrath. And so, Lord, we, we come before you, and I believe you're opening some eyes today that are helping people to see that there is an emptiness in their lives and they've never quite known what it is. They might have even attended church faithfully and they're drawn to the message of the gospel. But if somebody asked them, when did you become a Christian? They couldn't even answer that question. They don't even know what to say. But they attend church and they love church, but they've never said yes to you. And so, Lord, I'm praying that right now, today, that there's going to be someone who says, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I'm trusting in your cross. I'm trusting in your blood to pay for my sins. I don't want to pay for them, Lord. I, want, I, I, I receive your free gift. I want you to pay for them since you willingly did that. And now, Lord, come into my life and make me a new person. Do whatever you want to do in me. I, I give you permission. And Lord, let that be the prayer the rest of my life. Lord, do in me whatever you want to do. I want to be yours. Everything's on the table. Give me the courage to offer it to you and not be afraid to leave aside those things that are not of you, that lead me away from you, help me to be in a position that I'm constantly surrendering because, Lord, I want something more. I, I want the fullness of your spirit living in my life, a life of, of brokenness transformed into something beautiful. And I will always give you the praise until you call me home with my last breath. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, let me close with this. If you have made that decision for the very first time just now, you've never done it before. I know people make rededications, but if this is the first time you've done it, I want you to do a couple of things. First of all, I want you to remember that today is your spiritual birthday. Whatever day this is for you when you're watching this, Today is your spiritual birthday. Um, nobody told me that when I got saved, so I don't know when it was. I know it was in the summer of 1972. So I finally just picked a day. I know it was the summer of 1972. I know where I was. I was in my bedroom. I was on my knees at my bedside. I just don't know what day of the week it was. And so I just picked a day, I, July 7th, which is coming up in a, several weeks. That's my spiritual birthday. My wife knows her spiritual birthday. I had to pick one. So I just want you to know, write this date down. This is that you'll want to know. You'll want to know this day. It is your spiritual birthday. Secondly, you need to tell somebody. You need to testify about it. There is, there is something about saying the words. And, and I, you'll understand this. Those of you that are married, okay, I want you to, I don't care if you're 80 or 90. I want you to think back to when you were single. And do you remember the first time that you introduced yourself as married? I, th I think that uh, this is especially meaningful for, um, um, for, for women or anybody who, who, who chooses to change their name at marriage. In my case, in our case, my wife changed her last name to Bearden. You know, we got married. On that day, December 28th, um, but there was a moment when she verbally told somebody her name is Melanie Bearden. Now, we got married on December 28th, but 
the act of saying those words are a, co- a powerful, concrete reinforcement, friends. And I just want to tell you that, that I believe that will happen in your life. If you'll find a, a loving anybody, I, you could tell the, gro- the grocer at the grocery store. You could tell a family member. You could post it on Facebook in response to a video. You need to tell someone, even though if you don't, you don't have to understand it all. All you got to do is say, look, I don't, I hadn't got this all figured out. I'm just learning, but I surrendered my life to Jesus and and he's done something in me. And I just want to testify to that because I believe Jesus is great and I'm thankful for what he's done in me. Go now in the grace of God, be blessed and walk in his love now and always. Amen and amen. Thank you.